I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to all of our episodes and see show notes at FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. Gerald Posner is an investigative journalist and the author of several books, including ones about the assassinations of JFK and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His latest book, God's Bankers, is all about the Vatican's finances and how it got involved with the mafia and money launderers. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Jessica, great to be with you and Hemant. Sure. So explain to us this bank, this Vatican bank. Where, where did this even get started? Well, you know, you know, that's the great question in, in a sense, because you think to yourself, OK, it's the Vatican, it's a church, mm-hmm. uh, it's a religion. So why are they using a bank? I mean, they use banks, obviously, for their religious orders and to deposit money, but they have their own equivalent of a central bank. And they have that because, of course, they get to fly a sovereign flag. It's not just a religion, but it's a country. And they informed this bank, although they're 2,000 years old, until the middle of World War II. And that should start to set off some alarm bells immediately when you think to yourself, okay, so uh, you're the Catholic faith, the largest religion in the world at the time, and why are you establishing a bank that's sort of not reporting or open to anybody and has no type of oversight in the middle of the war? And we find out it's so that they can do business with both sides and, and get away with it. But So the beginning of the bank doesn't have a very good origin. And you're talking about World War II, correct, is when this World got started? War II. That's right, because the, in earlier times, they didn't need a bank they, because they didn't have to worry about raising money and doing investments and doing all the things that uh, capitalism does because in earlier centuries, they were sort of pope kings. You know, For right. the first 1,800 years, they got the benefit of running their own empire, sort of like British kings and, uh, and the French kings. Uh, they, they had 15,000 square miles of central Italy, and they levied taxes and collected fees, and that mostly paid for what they had to do. And then they sold indulgences. That's the benefit of being a religion. So they could go ahead and sell pieces of paper to the faithful saying, okay, you've committed sins, now pay us, and this uh, will forgive your, your sin. And uh, then they lost all of that. In 1870, they lost the entire empire. Italy got unified, and they went to this little post-it stamp piece of property, Vatican City, and they were no longer sovereign, and they didn't get their sovereignty back for 59 years until they got it back in 1929. They struck a deal with the fascist dictator of Italy, Benito Mussolini. They acknowledged him as the rightful government of Italy, and he said, and you're a sovereign nation, even though you're really, really tiny. And that gave them all the rights of a country again, together with the religion, and they sort of were back into the world of capitalism. So I'm really curious, like, this is all so interesting, and I think people really should be more aware of it, but where did you get interested in it? I understand you're a Catholic growing up. Did that have something to do with it? Yeah, not, I mean, I am, and I consider myself sort of a cultural Catholic. I'm not a practicing, I, not practicing by any means, but I, you know, went to Catholic school, a grammar school, Sisters of Charity, and I had a Catholic high school with the Jesuits. And so that, that was steeped into me in terms of that culture and the religion. But that wasn't why I wanted to do it. I actually wanted to do it because of my first book back in the 80s. I was doing this book on a Nazi war criminal who had been uh, Joseph Mengele, this Nazi doctor at Auschwitz, the biggest concentration camp. And in pursuing where he was and how he got away, I was down in Argentina and I came across these files in the secret police archives that showed that this priest in Rome and a bishop in Rome after World War II had helped Nazi war criminals get down to Argentina and safety. And I put that in the back of my mind. It wasn't the story I was doing then for that book, but I thought, you know, I want to come back at some point and look at the Catholic Church, the Nazis and World War II and see if there was more than just that sort of connection of a few sympathizer priests where they really doing business with them. And it took me until 2005 until I found a publisher in Simon & Schuster who was willing to let me go and do that. They said, okay, go ahead and look at it. And instead of just being a story about World War II, as you know, it turned out to be a story about the money and turned out to be like a 200-year history of follow the money in the Vatican. How do you even go about doing that? How do you follow the money when... I, I imagine there's system. yeah, it's a closed system, and I'm sure they're not publicizing this anywhere. <laughs> hey, look at all our yeah, bad yeah. money. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So the the so the, the part of this uh, that is challenging is trying to get incrementally some new information. And I did go the route, of course, of approaching the Vatican. I asked for access to their secret archives, which they actually call them the secret archives, and asked them for access to the the World War II material. <laughs> and they're like it's Bond fantastic. Villains. <laughs> it's great. You know, that's right. So, you know, where do you want to see files? In the secret archives. <laughs> you see those. Not, or the super secret archives. 
So <laughs> I so I figured I'll follow the process. So I applied to the bishop in Miami, figuring there's a bureaucracy here. It's like a country. So if I was applying to like see the files in Germany, maybe I would ask the German ambassador to the United States mm -hmm. to forward my request on to the foreign ministry who might then forward it to the Bundes archives or that. So I forwarded to the bishop of Miami, who seemed at least in this mail to be enthusiastic and say, oh, great. And then he forwarded to the nuncio in Washington, who's like the Vatican ambassador to the United States. And he sent it on to say, hey, this guy really looks like he's a serious researcher. I think he should get access to the secret archives to Rome. And there, the bishop who ran the secret archives like said, oh, what are you guys, crazy? No, <laughs> no way. So he sent back a letter that said, we're not letting him in. And they just ignored all of my requests for interviews over the the years, they just never even responded. So what it forced me to do, you said, how do you get the story? The, the, yeah. I knew that the Vatican Bank, to the extent that they did business with, let's say, uh, the Nazis during World War II, although they may have it as secrets in the Vatican, meaning that all of their files are secret, the companies or the governments that they did business with or transferred money to had to be on the receiving end. So there's a record there. And so I picked one industry to try to find out if I could get more information. That turned out to be an insurance because that was an area where all these big Italian businessmen were in World War II and they knew the people in the Vatican. And it turns out that was sort of a goldmine because in the insurance company files, the big German insurance companies, the big Italian insurance companies was the trail of evidence that showed how the Vatican Bank hid behind these Italian friends of theirs to own stakes in these big insurance companies in Eastern Europe. And th when Jews were being sent to the death camps, these uh, insurance uh, companies were sitting around a table and saying, you know what, these people are never coming back. No one knows that. So let's take the value, cash value of their life insurance policies now, and it'll increase our profits. And so the Vatican was making big outsized profits from this. And I got it sort of by going around and finding those files in the archives of several countries. Who, if you don't get access to the secret archives, who does? Ah, uh, friendly historians. And what yeah. I mean by that is, okay, so there's this big controversy over the Pope in World War II, Pius XII, was he quiet over the, the slaughter and, of uh, civilians in the Holocaust, and could he have done more? And um, I'm pretty hard on him in the book. I think that he was just, you know, sort of the wrong guy for the job. He's too timid, too diplomatic, never really publicly took the stance that would have put him at loggerheads with the Nazis. But there are real defenders of Pius in, in the Catholic Church, and they, there's even an effort to make him a saint. The people let into the archives are often those Catholic historians who end up getting access to files that make that pope look good. So they come out and say, oh, you didn't know that he really did tell these monasteries to open up their doors to Jews who were being chased by Nazis. They sort of, you know, they, they get the good documents and they're able to tell that story. That's who gets access there often. So when when you kind of talk about their financial dealings with cashing in these insurance policies, it sounds nefarious. It sounds like out and out evil almost. Do they justify these actions? Do they think they were in the right? Do they pretend it didn't happen? Mm. Uh. No, yeah, well, they pretend it didn't happen. I think that's right. Uh, so uh, they, they don't, Jessica, certainly uh, try to justify it in Hammond. I think you're right. They just pretend it didn't happen. And there is something. I mean, if you – can I prove that the Pope knew – the Pope in World War II knew that these insurance companies were doing that at the time? No. Mm. Can I prove that the cardinals around him knew it? No. And as a matter of fact, my guess is, my speculation based upon everything I've studied for all these years, is they didn't want to know. All they wanted to know was that the bank was doing well. So the guy who ran the bank was a layman, a pious Catholic, who was really this financial wizard. And he made it into this just, you know, like an investment bank on Wall Street, investing in arbitrage gold, investing in the Nazis and the Americans, and the British. He had money everywhere. So the, the bank was bringing in these big profits. And I think that all of the people who ran the religion were smart enough not to ask him in the middle of the war Where's the money coming from? They didn't want to know. They it just sounds wanted to know the big profits were coming. It sounds a lot like how they handle, supposedly handle all the child abuse scandals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that you know, I have a chapter on the the pedophile sex crisis, in the, and I look at it just from a financial viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because that's exactly how they respond in terms of the Vatican. Their first fear is really not to come in and do something about you know the, the instances of the pedophile abuse, but it's to say, hey. 
We want to make sure that everything is financially secure so that if one archdiocese or one diocese goes under from a lawsuit or a settlement, it won't bring down the next diocese next to it that's really wealthy. And <laughs> 11 dioceses in America have gone bankrupt as a result of not being able to pay their settlements or, or the, and finally figure out how to do it. They, they haven't affected the, any of the other dioceses in the country. And they were petrified in the Vatican that the Pope was going to get sued as some, they thought some clever American lawyer would sue the Pope eventually as the ultimate employer of the huh. pedophile priest. And that, of course, happened five different times uh, in these class actions. Uh, pope Benedict, the previous Pope, was named. And finally, an American court, an appellate court ruled you cannot sue the Pope in American court because this is when they were able to use their sovereign hat. He's the head of a sovereign nation. You can't sue the head of a sovereign nation in American court. So the Vatican gets something really unusual in terms of the religious world. They get to play the religious card when they want to, and they get to play the sovereign card. No other religion really gets to do that because they don't have that equivalent of a, you know, of a flag at the United Nations. They don't have a flag at the UN because they don't want one. They're just permanent observers. But it, it, being able to play that sovereign card really gives them an extra power and punch. So is there anything to be done to kind of disband this institutionalized corruption that we're seeing in, in Catholicism in the, in, in the Vatican? Yes. <laughs> so, and here's the good news. Um, to the, the book actually ends on a note of hope in oh. that... Uh, uh, yeah, I know. It's, uh, the, <laughs> uh, and some people think I'm too uh, hopeful, uh, but uh, it's not just because some people are, are enthusiastic because they're enthusiastic about the new pope. Uh, Francis gets some people excited, and so they think that he's the the real deal, and that's fine. But and he has done some very good things in terms of reforming the Vatican Bank uh, and putting in reforms that aren't just window dressing, but things that I think will change its culture. Mm -hmm. He signed a tax sharing agreement with Italy and things like this that are uh, that will mm -hmm. fundamentally change it, maybe make it a boring mid-level bank going forward. But <laughs> I say the reason that for my hope is because they have no choice. And, and what I mean by that is in 1999, Italy decided it was going to give up its old currency, the lira, and mm -hmm. go with the euro, the mm -hmm. common currency. When it did that, it put the Vatican in a bind because the Vatican used the lira for its own currency. That's why, you know, that's why money laundering was so easy between Italy and the Vatican. They had the same currency. So the Vatican decided to go with the euro. But what they didn't know then is that that meant that they would be subject to, their bank would be subject to oversight, financial oversight from Brussels, the European Union. Huh. So the European Union has now sent in regulators twice to look at the Vatican Bank. This was an institution that operated only in the dark. Not even other divisions in the Vatican could see it. So the Vatican passed its first laws against money laundering in 2011. They didn't exist before that. They've passed their first laws against the financing of terrorism in 2011. They never had laws against it. And they passed their first laws about the amount of cash that you could bring into the city state because, you know, we have like $10,000 in the U.S. or 10,000 euros in Europe. They had no limits. You could bring in $10 million on pallets of tr in a truck if you wanted to. <laughs> so they passed laws against that. So they are being forced by the European Union to become a compliant bank. And in so doing, they'll no longer be able to stay as an offshore bank in the heart of Rome, as I described them. So it's not going to be I a think, secret Cayman Islands hiding out like, in right. the middle of Italy. It, exactly. And you know, it, it, uh, I think that the part about that, uh, to me, that Hemant is so interesting, when you say a secret uh, Cayman Islands hanging out in the middle of Italy, that's what everyone should think about. That's what made this story to me unique, which is, you talk about, okay, you've got all these tax havens, Bermuda, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, uh, Philippines, Hong Kong. But the difference is with the Vatican, you have two-tenths of a square mile in the middle of the capital of a foreign country. Mm -hmm. So it would be as if in London or Paris or New York, you had two-tenths of a square mile, tiny, like five square blocks that belong to another nation. And if you lived outside of those blocks in New York or London, all you had to do was know somebody who lived inside that area, like one of those priests, and get your money in gold, diamonds, or cash to them. And once they deposited in that bank, it disappeared. No one knew where it was. No tax people could find it. No, no uh, prosecutors could find it. Remember, this is a bank with only one branch. It's inside Vatican City. It has no other branches in the world. It has only one shareholder, the Pope. 
It doesn't have to turn a profit by its own <laughs> charter, and it doesn't make any loans. So it's not a, a typical bank. But what it does do, it takes in cash. It, it's been a it's been a haven for money launderers over time because of the fact that it got it was used for that, and the Vatican would take a small percentage, or the, the priest who handled the money would take a small percentage. The mafia used it, and then we learned that in the 1990s and the 2000s that it became the location for Italian politicians to use for their own personal slush funds. So the guy who was Italy's seven-time prime minister, that'll tell you something about how uh, dysfunctional Italy is, right? Seven times prime minister. Uh, the, so he, uh, Giulio Andriotti died about a year ago. It turns out he had a $60 million slush fund inside the Vatican Bank called the Foundation for Cardinal Spellman. Now, there was no foundation with that name anywhere in the world. It just existed inside the Vatican Bank, but he used it to pass money to everybody from his to from his wife's jeweler in Florence to his political cronies to payoffs in politics. So the, and that what so what you had is you had Italy's top politicians using the Vatican Bank as sort of their own personal slush funds and that gave the Vatican power because it knew the dirty secrets about Italy's politicians but at the same time meant that the Italian politicians were always going to pr uh, protect the church's right to no taxation and things like that so it's a really incestuous relationship so i think an interesting thing has been happening with the catholic church uh, now that uh, pope francis is in he seems to be like the cool pope. Do you think that was like a purposeful move by the Catholic Church to sort of in, like improve their image? Or do you think it's it's because it sounds like he's actually trying to change things. So is that ultimately going to be bad for those who elected him? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the, he's the first Jesuit elected. The, the Jesuit order, which had been so he's a, a lot of people at the top of the Catholic Church were distrustful of the Jesuits. They weren't sure. This is probably the last time they'll elect a Jesuit because he, you know, the, every election, I talk about this a little bit in the book, they they have the, so Pope dies, and then they have the conclave, the gathering of cardinals to elect the new one. Mm -hmm. And the, as the Catholic Church tells it, the Holy Spirit comes down, descends on the cardinals and helps them select the next pope. Of course, what really happens is it's like bare knuckles politics, just like the Republicans and Democrats knocking each other out. And some cardinals want a conservative, traditional, sort of old line pope. And then others want um, a more liberal, reforming pope. That's the fight for the soul of the church every time. And this time they went with the reformer. The thing that's interesting is what's taking place behind the scenes is the Italian cardinals who no longer make up a majority. They, they can't elect on their own one pope, even if they all voted together, and they all dislike each other, so it's hard for, to get them <laughs> to vote together. But they want an Italian back in the papacy because until they elected a Polish pope back in 1978, that has been the, that had been the first non-Italian pope in 450 years. Hmm. So the Italians had a lock on the papacy. Then they lost it to the Polish pope in 78, John Paul II. He goes until 2005, and then the next pope selected is German. Mm -hmm. That was Benedict, the last pope. And now they come up for the third election, and instead of going to an Italian, it goes to an Argentine. So the Italians are itching to get the papacy back, but um, they're going to have to wait uh, until uh, they Francis, lose the game uh, of papal <laughs> survivor. <laughs> That's exactly right. And as a matter of fact, let me tell you, I'm half Italian. I will say that one of the yeah, reasons that I think the Vatican is – okay, so then you'll appreciate this, I of think. Of course I will. One of the reasons for the chaotic mess at the Vatican is that it, the curia, the bureaucracy that runs it, that underneath the popes is over 90%. It used to be 98%. It's 90% Italian. So that – it's it's a system built with nepotism. Uh, the cardinals and the bishops who run the church have brothers and nephews on the other side of the wall in Italian business and industry. Um, they're cutting favors with contractors. They're doing outsized contracts. Uh, there's it's just uh, such a, a sort of incestuous melting pot that it's part, I think, of the uh, the problems of why this church has ended up with so many headaches. I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is, you know, if the Vatican Bank doesn't let you into their archives, you had to figure out a workaround. So you went to these insurance companies who had done dealings with them, and that's how you got information here, which is very clever. And so I, I want to ask about, like, this investigative journalist aspect to it. First of all, you know, with your whole career, uh, the books you've written, how does this rank in terms of difficulty, in terms of investigating the story and finding out stuff that no one else had uncovered before. Okay, so the, I guess, I don't know if this will make sense or not, 
but this seems to me to be the most difficult. But I think that's also because memory fades a little bit about how painful other experiences were. <laughs> so that you know, I hear you know all the time, uh, women will often say in childbirth they'll forget about how painful it was after you know childbirth. Uh-huh. They'll say, "Oh no, it's just fantastic." So I mean, I forget that maybe on uh, the assassination of, uh, of Martin Luther King, where I'd really broken some new ground, I was really in like the archives and up to my eyeballs and chasing people around the country and getting information. At that time, if you had asked me, I would have said, that's the toughest thing I had done. Or maybe Mengele, the Nazi doctor, when I was wandering around the wilds of Paraguay with some neo-Nazis. Or uh, my wife, Trish, and I were in for a couple of months in the Golden Triangle, uh, hanging out with heroin dealers, young heroin dealers Jeez. who were uh, Chinese triads and, uh, and DEA guys. That was a combination of difficult and exciting at the same time. But so every book seems bad. This seems the worst to me by far, but maybe because it's the freshest to me. Yeah. <laughs> and and also, I, okay, you see the end result. The right. reader sees the end result. So you say, oh, that's great. He was able to make some new ground in the, in the area of what the church did with in terms of Nazis in World War II. But what you don't see is how many brick walls I did hit that I didn't get through. Mm. So – for every area where you make some progress, like in insurance, there is another area where you, you kept trying and nothing came through. Or you sat in archives, uh, and you went through Polish files, and there was nothing there that was useful. So I think a lot of investigative reporting is reporting on 10 different avenues that may be productive. And in the end, if you're lucky, one or two will prove to be productive, and the other eight may prove not to be at all. Now the question is, for any good investigator coming into this story, I've taken you so far. I can take you into the fact that the Vatican Bank did business with through these Italian proxies with insurance companies in World War II. Can I tell you how much money they made? No. Can I tell you um, – the extent of their uh, – how much uh, interest they held in each company? No. Where's that information? It's inside the Vatican. And that's why since the book's been published, I started a, um, a, a website called freethefiles.com, which is a link to signing up an online petition to ask the Pope to free the World War II files. Is it going to force him to do it? No. Mm-hmm. But I still would like to present it to him when he comes to America in September and say, you know, Francis, you are the reformer. If anyone's going to do it, maybe you will. A lot of people would like to see you free those files. Uh, it would be nice if you do. Have you had any response from Francis at all? You sent him a copy no, of the book, right? I did. I, yeah, I'm sort of the the glass half full <laughs> type of guy. So um, I think that it's always worth even on a long shot, you know, send, making a request for an interview or doing sure. all those things because the worst somebody can do is ignore you or say no. Uh-huh. So I did send him a copy of the book with a cover letter that pretty much said, you know, with all due respect, this is the history of the finance of the Vatican. You probably know most of it, but it's now your history mm-hmm. because he's elected as Pope. He's called the Vicar of Christ on Earth. And you have to think that, you know, the men who are these cardinals and bishops, for the most part, they really believe that. And if they do, then he has an extra obligation going forward to try to make sure that history is not repeated. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I thought there was some hope that he might have reached out is because he is unpredictable. That's the great thing about Francis. But um, so far, uh, it's just silence from there. Are you just picturing the book sitting on his bedside table? Like, oh, I'm going to get to it. I just wanted to finish (laughs) the latest Dan Brown novel. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, I would think, you know, that in the old days, the people around him and his like assistants or that and the, the, the Monsignors who are his assistants would just keep anything from him like that. And they would just say, you know, that's just troublesome. Forget about it. But yeah. because he is unpredictable and because things do get around, I don't think they can afford to do that. So uh, <laughs> but the, the thing that the Vatican does is you'll understand this immediately. They, they have because they are this 2000 year old institution, they have the long view which is we survived the Huns, we survived uh, Napoleon taking the Pope back to France as a, uh, as a prisoner, we survived Hitler, we survived everything. So a book comes out that makes it uncomfortable for, for them about their money in history, they just wait it out. They sort of duck down and they wait for the bad news to stop and then they know they can keep doing whatever they do. Have you gotten any blowback from Catholics in general, not necessarily in the Vatican, but just people who are Catholic? Uh, yes, I uh, the uh, I have mo- some okay. Some Catholics think it's anti-Catholic. They and they say, oh, it's an anti-Catholic book. 
Uh, and I see, well, you know, and then some people think that I'm Jewish uh, because of Posner and I've written books about uh, Nazi with Joseph Mengele. And so they just assume I talk a lot about World War Two in this book and doing business with the Nazis. So they say, uh, you know, and I get some nasty comments about, you know, oh, you Jews, I'm sick of this and that. Oof. When I tell them that I'm Catholic, they're just sort of stunned at that. Uh, they think it's a trick. Uh, but uh, then uh, so, you know, I say, look, to the extent that I was born Catholic and well, cu a cultural Catholic, you know, not not a practicing Catholic, but and then it's my history as well. It's just a straightforward history. You can't make it good just because you want it to be good. Sure. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that makes any headway. But in addition, um, I think that uh, th th they're just uncomfortable with it, some. Uh, and others have, uh, you know, written uh, emails to me or over the transom on Twitter or whatever and say, you know, I'm Catholic. I'm practicing Catholic. This was a tough book to read. It had a lot of low points, but I'm really hopeful that this is like the worst stuff that I'll read and going forward is going to be a lot better. So, you know, uh, th th that's, th that's the better view. I mean, I feel like they're still on the train after the whole sex abuse scandal. Like some <laughs> banking isn't going to throw them, right? Yeah. You know, but you know, but what is interesting though is that in the end, so I kept thinking from the outside before I did the research, that's the very same thing. So I'm thinking, okay, they, they went through the sex abuse scandal, but then you realize when you get into the sex abuse scandal, so much of it comes back to money. And that's, and that's the part that, you know, I think. Uh, for people, a lot of people won't be surprised by that. They'll say, okay, it's a church. I realize it's about money. I get that. But the, what made it different for me here is that, again, I come back to the sort of duality of being a sovereign country and a religion. Mm -hmm. The same guys, and I can say guys because there are no women involved. This is, you know, just strictly a guy's organization. So the same guys who are running the church at the top, the cardinals and the pope, are the very same guys who then are stepping to the side and making decisions about uh, as a sovereign country for Vatican City. They don't have different people doing it. So it's not like one is running the religion and another one is doing the decisions for the government. It's mm -hmm. the same people doing both. And that's part of the problem. But since money's at the core of both, raising money for the religion and then making sure that as a country they're running at a profit and not a big deficit, it gets all mixed up. And that's where it gets real slippery, I think. It seems insane that they're like worried about raising money when they clearly are like, sitting in vaults of gold. Yeah, well, you know, it, the, one of the things the church has always had an amazing ability to do through its history, and you see this when you look at the, like, the story of money in, in the church, is be able to claim poverty time and time again, even though it was taking big amounts of money. So they, they often say, we're short of money, the Pope is short of money, raise money for the, uh, uh, the Pope, Peter's Pence, we talked about that before. And next year, Pope Francis has called for what will be a holy year, a jubilee year. Those usually are only called every 25 or 50 years. There, when pilgrims go to Rome and they get special, uh, you know, they can have special meetings with some of the clerics, the Pope is doing special things, they get and they sell uh, everything. It's a big money raiser. The Jubilee holy years are, will raise millions and millions of dollars for the church. So when I saw that announced, I thought to myself, that's very interesting. They're revert, revorting back to sort of this old style way of bringing in even more <laughs> money next year. Do you have an estimate of what the net worth of, I don't know, the Catholic Church or the Vatican, like do you have an estimation or is it just impossible to say? It, it's, imp it's impossible, at least for me to say, if there's somebody out there who's clever enough to do it, I want to hear from them. Because <laughs> the reason it's impossible to say is, first, you'd have to value the equivalent of that art that's inside of Vatican oh, City yeah. itself. You know, okay, so, you know, the, the ceilings, the Sistine Chapel, the Michelangelo's, priceless. If some Russian oligarch, and I guess now that oil's down so low, there aren't many Russian oligarchs that could afford to buy the Sistine Chapel. But, in the, you know, six months ago, or some Saudi prince wanted to buy his billions of dollars. But beyond that, the real estate of every country, every Catholic diocese is kept separately on a different set of books, so you don't know its real value. So New York City, the largest property owner besides New York City is the Catholic Church. Oh, the that. largest property owner in Italy, aside from the Italian government, in the Italian country is the Catholic Church. And remember, they don't pay taxes on that property. So not only is it incredibly, you know, it's worth a great deal. It's incredibly lucrative in terms of what the assets are, but it also has an advantage that no regular competitor or country could ever have, which is sort of that tax exemption. Yeah. And, and that makes a difference. The only country on the planet 
that owns more land outside of the mass of its country than in the country itself. It's a really unique and wow. peculiar country for that. Going back uh, to your investigative journalism aspect of this, what do you know now about reporting on all these different stories you've done? What do you know now that you didn't know when you were starting your career? Oh, I know what I know In terms of now, the art of investigating, not necessarily the specifics of the stories. Yeah, no, no, I get it. The, uh, I think that the um, what I've learned that I sort of wish that I had known some ways probably um, haven't really early on was uh, just to, instead of approaching just one line of what you think might be the right research, have four or five going at once because the one you're going after may prove to be, as we talked about earlier, so that brick wall gets nowhere. And if that's the only one you're chasing, you have to start fresh with something else. Hmm. So have like six lines in the water at the same time for possible information. The other thing that's critical is there's nothing, nothing that will replace original reporting in terms of primary source materials in archives. So I know that a lot of people are going to roll their eyes and think, oh, I have to go to an archive. Yeah, you do, because they're not all digitized. And the great thing is a lot of people are lazy and don't want to do it, but you have to get in there. In those files and archives, if you're doing anything remotely historical, are, are microfiche and microfilm and all these old files that will sometimes fill in something that you didn't know beforehand. And then when you start your interviews, you've got so much more information because the interviews are only good if you are really, really knowledgeable. I remember you know, so many times it'll be a home run interview, but that's because I knew so much going in that I knew the questions to ask. And on a time when I didn't have the chance to prepare fully, I hadn't gotten into all the files, later I'd finish and I'd, uh, six months later I'd say, I wish I was talking to that person again. They won't give me a second interview because now I know what question I need to ask. Right. That's always the, the key, right? Yeah, that's, no, that's fascinating. So um, we're coming up on time. So your book is called God's Bankers and it's out on shelves now, right? Yes, uh, it should be on shelves. Uh, as authors, you always worry about that. You sort of go into a bookstore and nobody's ever heard of your book or that, but it should be everywhere right now. And uh, the I think it's sort of, you know, the, the feeling is here's here's where it's great is if somebody, okay, so somebody says to me, you know what? I was never crazy about, I had a British professor the other day called Tudor Parfit. Isn't that, it's a great name. Cool name. Um, yeah. Is a great name, and he's British, and he's actually Church of England, and he's uh, he's a professor. He's covered uh, Jewish studies and everything else. He's really an eclectic and interesting guy. And he said, I don't really like the Catholic Church. I've never liked it, um, and I have a very low opinion of them. And I read your book, and I was still really surprised. Mm -hmm. Now, that's great because – what you don't want is you don't want somebody to read it and say, you know what? I sort of expected this. Yeah. This is what I thought I would find because that's good. And then, you know, I, I get somebody else who thinks that they're, uh, it can't be, you know, there's nothing that will surprise them anymore. And there are some, you know, twists and turns in there that to me still, I don't care, you know, how much faith you have, even as a, uh, as a real uh, hardcore Catholic or that, if you read it, there have to be some points in there in which you, you shake your head and then you think, if nothing else, this book proves that the men who run the church are certainly every bit as mortal as anyone else. There's no infallibility when it comes to that. And you put a group of men together with billions of dollars and put them in the dark with no oversight, like you did with the Vatican Bank, and human nature will take over, and some will be honest, but some are also going to get up to all types of dirty dealings, and that's exactly what happened here. I imagine it's got to be kind of insulting if someone reads your book and they're like, yeah, yeah I kind, kind of, of this. expected this. <laughs> like, It's like, no, I've done a lot of research. Like, You did not expect all this because that's what I've been working on for a decade. How annoying you know, is that? Now <laughs> yeah, no, a little, a little annoying. And of course, sometimes that's so fantastic because sometimes people also have you know, a much grander um, ambition. So, uh, you know, I've had uh, people that were disappointed that I didn't find out that the popes were murdering, uh, you know, each other and murdering bankers. And, Ooh. you know, <laughs> and there certainly are some murders in here. You know, there's a businessman who ends up dead from cyanide. And there's another guy found hanging under London Bridge. But I didn't find enough murders to satisfy the real murder freaks. So, you know, <laughs> I don't, it was unfortunate. I don't want to ask you, because uh, I'm sure you keep the stuff under wraps until it's ready to go. So I don't want to ask you, you know, what exactly you're working on, but... Uh, how many sort of lines of investigation are you working on, hoping something might pan out for the next book? Yeah, that's that. You've actually asked that question exactly as I would ask it, which is meaning that how normally many, somebody yeah. will say, "What? Yeah, what are you working on next?" And I don't have the answer to that. But what I am working on, 
uh, uh, Tricia works with me. The two of us are working on like six lines <laughs> of inquiry right now, one of which will turn out to be the next project, but we don't know which. And so this is this is like this is the period of high expectation when you're not quite sure what you're going to be spending the next few years of your life on. You've got literally in this case six. We had four and it sort of expanded out to two more. They're very, very different themes and storylines, some more current, some a little bit more historical, but really different. And and we sort of like each one or we wouldn't even be looking at them. But now we have to do a, enough reporting and research so that we feel comfortable there's a, enough to then go and do for a couple of years. And then we have to present maybe two or three, maybe two at the most, to a publisher. And the publisher will say either, oh, yeah, we're interested in that one. And, you know, uh, we'll pay you some money and you go off and do this for a couple of years and then come back with a book. Or they'll say, no, those don't interest us at all, in which case we have to go back to the drawing board and try to come up with maybe one of the other ideas. So this is sort of this odd, odd time when you're trying to find something you love and want to do and that a publisher will like and want to publish and then you have to keep your fingers crossed and hope that when you do the reporting you get something new that no one's ever heard of and that when you publish it two three four years down the road that the public will care about it because you don't know what's going on uh, that's absurd the, <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> it, so if this podcast is, is still around in 10 years we'll have you back on for your <laughs> right. next book right <laughs> is this the well, first well, time is this the first time you and your wife have done a project together no, we actually um, have done them together for since every book, believe it or not. So you, you uh, worked together on Megalo- the research for all the books. Yeah, we worked together on the research, and so she did two books on on women's health. One, her first book was called "This Is Not Your Mother's Menopause" about why you don't sure. have to go through menopause with uh, hormone replacement, and then no hormones, no fear. Sort of an updated paperback, and I did the research with her on those books. And I, at that point, was certainly the guy in all of Miami and New York City who knew more about menopause <laughs> than any other guy around. It's just as she, she's um, originally Jewish from London, and she knows the succession of popes from Leo the Thirteenth on <laughs> like no other Jewish girl knows in the entire world. So, you know, we share each other's obsessions at those moments. Hammond and I can't even get our spouses to listen to this stupid show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's, it gets even better. Wait, not only that, <laughs> does she work with me on it, but I punish her in essence by having her go and listen. She, and no, she's not listening to this, but when this, you know, she will li- be listening to this on the podcast. She'll be hearing it. And she, so she has to be punished then by going through the entire uh, uh, sort of talk about the book for the next two months as well, um, even though she could do the same. Uh, she could do the same interviews. Yourself. Yeah. Hi, That's thanks right. for listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Gerald, thank you so much for your time. We will post links to all of this on the website, and the book is God's Bankers. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hemant and Jessica. I really appreciate you know your sort of you know skeptical view of coming in uh, and and looking at it in terms of the uh, of the friendly atheist podcast, but at the same time, sort of saying you know what is this story and and why is it there and how did you get it? And I really enjoyed talking to the two of you. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. We hope you'll join us next time.